needing coffee, I do. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for making it to um, such an early panel um, this morning on day two. Um, what we will be doing is really looking at the best practice forum on countering online abuse and gender-based violence. Um, we have only an hour and a half and we also have, as you can see, a fantastic whoa, um, uh, panel of speakers. Uh, actually, more like a, we're trying to turn this into a bit of a talk show, right? Because I'm like your fabulous talk show host. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I even dressed up. Um, so what we will try to do is really go through um, some of the key highlights and recommendations from the Best Practice Forum throughout, but open it up at different junctures for inputs, insights and responses. And also, of course, in a talk show, the audience is very important, audience participation. Um, so please also feel free to kind of jump in and uh, have questions or provide your insights and, uh, and inputs and so on. Because we only have an hour and a half, so I will sort of um, start relatively um, on time, um, quite quickly, even though I know people will be trickling in, and trickling in as the day goes along. Um, so let us start by maybe talking about the methodology. I'll introduce Henri Van Spuy, who's been really, really critical uh, and, and really like, a, without her, this BPF would not really have gone through what, we've, what we have today. It's a 162 pages document, which you are most, more than welcome to look through in the IGF website. Is this working? Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm... I think we should shut up. Okay, let's try again. I have the lovely task of talking about methodology, with, which normally bores most people, so I'll try to do this quick. But I do think that this is important for especially a topic like this one. And to start off with, I think we should put this in context of, of what best practice forums are in the IJF body and uh, just quickly briefly explain to some of you how this fits into what the IGF does. The best practice forums are basically intersessional activities which means it's what we do throughout the year and not just at the, at the IGF like at this, at this meeting. So it's a, it's a lovely opportunity to work as a community throughout the year to produce something hopefully tangible that people can use and people can take back to their communities and hopefully use and, and improve whatever topic we're looking at. So this year there's six best practice forums and most of them, or four out of the six, are what we normally call narrow issues in internet governance, so more technical, and two of them are broader. So the other one is multi-stakeholder mechanisms and then this one. Um, what makes these BPFs quite interesting is that they all have method methodological freedom and you can base, so basically you can, we can adopt any approach that you want to and that's good because these topics are so different. Uh, you, can, you can adopt whatever methodology you think works in this context. Um, and for this one, we had the mandate from the MAG, which is the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Committee, to look at practices to counter online abuse of women. And one of our first exercises as a, as a group was to do a mapping exercise of how we want to address this topic. And uh, basically we use Etherpad and we used, you'll see in later in this presentation, we use these open editable you know, platforms quite often throughout the nine months that this best practice forum has been working. And we basically mapped what we wanted to cover in this BPF. It is quite a, a wide topic um, and we thought we should prioritize certain aspects of, of this work. So, we redefined the mandate or the scope from the MAG and we, we are fully, fully allowed to do that and we thought we would look at something more encompassing, so online abuse and gender-based violence against both women and girls. Um, and Jack will talk more about that definition and one of the recommendations of this best practice forum is that we need to look at definitions, et cetera, more, you know, more carefully in how we address this very important topic. Um, the primary goal, if I can move on to the methodology, um, was to, gather stakeholder input and to get as many people from diverse parts of our community involved in addressing this from, from different aspects. Um, so we followed the normal IGF um, you know, methodology or approach of being bottom up, open, transparent and inclusive. So all of our meetings, et cetera, were open. Uh, anyone could join and we had a lot of people coming in throughout the nine months and joining late or you know, participating when they could. So our general approach um, was to have meetings every two weeks and those were scheduled using doodle polls to kind of make it uh, accessible for people all over the world. After each meeting we would distribute meeting summaries and meeting audio. 
to also help people who couldn't attend. And then the other things that we used was the BPF has a dedicated um, mailing list. So that was used quite often and we asked people to participate and quite a lot of people subscribed to that mailing list. We also had an online platform which you can still see on the website and that we also used to publish any documents that we were asking feedback on or you know, the meeting summaries, et cetera, et cetera. As I mentioned, editing platforms, we use Google Docs and Etherpad. Uh, or the IJF's review platform all the time so that people could see where we are and where we were going with the work and could comment directly. And then last but not least, social media. So whenever we had, so we were doing something, we would call in for input on social media. And we also had a specific pain, campaign related to social media, which I'll refer to a bit later. So the first draft was basically populated from that synthesis document that I mentioned in the beginning. And what we did is we extracted a skeleton of work that we wanted to address, so basically topics um, or headings, and we started populating those in, the, in our meeting. So for over two months, we um, had this on Google Docs, and people would go in and edit it directly and could put their comments or put content. Um, and we also would extract sections, extract sections from that um, document and paste it on emails and ask people for direct input. We realized, however, that the group was still quite limited and we needed to get input in different ways. So what we started uh, developing was a more targeted approach to getting wider stakeholder input. Um, and also to get back to the meetings, the problem is these meetings tend to have a core group of participants who are you know, very enthusiastic and that's great, but we also needed to, to get more input. So we had basically four other approaches, so a, a real mixed methodology, if you may, um, including a survey, case studies, um, direct input on our drafts, and a social media campaign. And I'll just quickly go into those. The survey was drafted um, during one of our meetings. We asked the community for input on the questions and basically distributed on, on Facebook, etc. Mm -hmm. And we received 56 responses, which if you know IGF structures is, is, is a lot. And we were particularly happy with the fact that um, Many of those responses came from developing countries and quite a, a nice mixture of countries too, 25 different countries. You know, for instance, in the Africa region, we had something, we had South Africa, Kenya, Uganda, um, Tunisia, Gambia. We had, you know, a real nice mixture of countries and input from different, different also stakeholder groups. So that was nice. And, and what it, you know, while it's not a representative um, study or, or population, it does give us a snapshot of what people were thinking about this issue. And that can be found in Appendix 2 of the draft document, which is on our page. Uh, in addition to that, we asked people for case studies, and those were both formal and informal. We didn't have any guidelines for what a case study should look like. So you can see those in Appendix 3 of the document. Um, basically, we had from quite a few different individuals and countries. You can see the list of countries on that slide. Afghanistan, Brazil, Argentina, we had the Council of Europe, Philippines, et cetera, et cetera. Those were also, same as the, same as the survey, were imp input directly in draft two, um, which I'll talk about in a bit. And then the last you know, direct measure of getting more input was a social media campaign, which we planned at the same time that, IG, that the second draft was on the review platform of the website. Um, it was around impact, because we wanted to know what people feel specifically about the consequences of online violence. And the question was, what impact does online violence have on women and girls? Use the hashtag Take Back the Tick to contribute examples to IGF 2015. Take Back the Tick is a hashtag that belongs to the APC. It's, uh, it's been in circulation for quite a while and has a strong following, which is why we used it. We also had a lot of APC support in this BBF. Um, Jack will talk more about the social media campaign. As some of you know, it attracted quite a lot of attention, not necessarily positive attention, but um, over one weekend we had 25,000 tweets um, and a lot of other media, so videos and, and um, a lot of emails, and uh, it, if at the least it provides us with a good case study of why this topic should be studied. <laughs> Uh, the findings of that case study of that social media campaign will be in Appendix 5. Unfortunately, it's not in the current draft, but it will be in the next draft. So draft 2 was basically populated from these sources that I just mentioned, so case studies, surveys, uh, the social media campaign wasn't incorporated in that. It was published on the IGF review platform with all the other BPFs. It attracted 96 comments, which is also significant if you compare it to other BPFs, um, significantly more. 36 unique commentators. I must mention, though, that um, some 
<laughs> not so friendly, and also perhaps, uh, I don't know, uh, George Orwell's, you know, George Orwell 1984 um, kind of commentators. But it was good. We, um, we used those um, comments and we did a proper thematic analysis of them and identified nine common codes that could be identified from, from the comments. And it was quite interesting to see what the main concerns of the participants were, concerns and input, really valuable sometimes, some not so valuable, but they were all analyzed individually, and for each one of them, we gave an action. So we said, with this comment, we do this, it falls under this action, and it was incorporated into our final, or our current draft, which is draft JP, and it's on the IGF's website at the moment. So draft JP, we're currently receiving input on, also at this session, and that is why the dot, dot, dot is there. We will update that and hopefully have a final version in uh, December. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anri. Um, yes, so as you can see, it's been a very comprehensive um, kind of methodology. We really did try to take this um, um, and uh, use it as a, as a, as a you know, provided really um, significant effort in trying to open up the process, get as much, um, um, as much input as possible from as many stakeholders as possible. Um, and this included um, attracting the attention of um, potentially bad actors. Um, so um, when we were running the social media campaign, uh, there was actually, uh, there was an announced targeted attempt to hijack um, the hashtag in which we were trying to run the conversation. And that's also why you see like quite such a high number of, uh, of tweets and retweets as well. We tried to do some level of analysis, uh, but to be honest, it was quite, it really took up a lot of energy and resources to try and respond. Um, in, uh, and in the, in the process of trying to really facilitate an open conversation, it really raised questions around what happens when um, an open and participatory platform sort of um, becomes targeted by bad actors who's actually not interested in having a constructive conversation, but really interested to really um, sort of um, you know, shut you down or um, create sort of ad hominem kind of um, arguments and not really interested in dialogue as such, but more interested in stopping dialogue. So that also gave us a lot of, um, uh, a lot of interesting food for thought, like nothing like being steeped in hot tea to know the flavours of it. Um, and also, you know, really pointed out um, to us why this work is quite critical and the, and the, and the complexities of it as well and quite a lot of um, misunderstanding around what, it, what the topic is around. So... Um, before I begin going into the finding, maybe I can introduce to you our guests for today. Let's start from the left. Um, we have Rebecca McKinnon. Rebecca McKinnon is from, look, I have this wonderful list. Um, you work on the digital, uh, Ranking Digital Rights Project as well as um, Global Voices. Um, and then we have Gary Fowley, the head of IT liaison office to the UN in, the, in New York. And then we have Augustina Caliger, Caligari. Sorry if my pronunciation is terrible. Um, who, and she's from the Personal Data Protection Center and an ombudsman uh, and work at the ombudsman center, uh, ombudsman's office of uh, Buenos Aires City. Um, next, we have Narelle Clark, um, from uh, who is the uh, immediate past president of ISOC, and then Anri, of course. I think we need to give Anri an applause actually after this wonderful methodology. <laughs> I know it's morning and it's really early, but harder la, louder, louder. <laughs> Thanks very much. And then we have Nikat Dad, uh, who is the founder of uh, Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan, uh, and also a really good friend. And Hiba Hussein, a new good friend um, from Google, who's a public policy analyst in Google. Um, and then we have uh, Mariana. Can you get your um, organization properly? Mariela, Mariana Valente. Um, who is the director of Internet Lab in Brazil. Um, and then we have Fran Marovic, the director and the, uh, of the OSCE Rep on freedom, freedom of Media. Freedom of Media. And then uh, Professor David Kay, who is a special rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Opinion, who is sitting, somehow sitting in the shadows and I'm not sure why. Today he's feeling a little bit shy. Huh? Oh yes, Patrick, yes, come. Yes. And we have a late, late, late participant, but very valuable, pa Patrick Pennings, Pennings um, from the Council of Europe, um, head of the Information Society Department. We have so many um, wonderful brains that we actually are sort of crowded into the corner. Um, but hopefully we get to um, have some time to really get some quite you know, important insights from all of this. So let's start with maybe looking at some of the key highlights and recommendations so that I can hopefully share with you um, the product of these nine months of work. Um, firstly, I think one of the things that we really um, uh, found is that um, definitions is complex. 
what is this topic about? Um, it covers a whole range of things, a whole range of acts. People refer to it differently. Some called it cyber vow, some called it e vow, some called it on vow means violence against women. Some called it um, online violence against women. Some and uh, we at APC call it technology related violence against women, and then so on and so forth. So we op we one of the things that we found that was really important is that we really needed a more comprehensive understanding of the issue, um, and. Um, so we needed a comprehensive yet flexible definition with a kind of wider and global um, recognition as well. So because we understood that the area is, um, is, it is getting increased recognition, which is a great thing, but there's so many um, uh, things are also changing and uh, unraveling as, as we speak. We're getting to understand the issue more, how it is manifesting itself, what are the different ways in which it affects different people. So the definition to some extent needed to be quite flexible to be able to incorporate this, but it needed to be quite comprehensive as well. So what we thought is it's important to um, just start with human rights. Human rights um, offline applies online equally. It's not too complicated. It is a human rights issue. Um, and not to get distracted that it's you know, somehow particular or special or, 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 or weird. Um, it is basically fundamentally a human rights violation. Um, and that it's, um, it's, it's important to also start to locate this issue as it's part of the definition of gender-based violence. That just makes it, um, that just gives you the first solid ground to walk from because gender-based violence has lots of agreed definitions already. It is very much linked to the issue of discrimination and violation of rights. It is part of perpetuating of that cycle. But what's particular about this is then how, how does um, ICTs and the internet impact on gender-based violence? What are the new manifestations? How is it being used? So on and so forth, and how can we unpack this? Um, and finally, what was really important is that there is a need to understand and address the underlying causes that promote the problem. So not focusing on the surface or on the technology, but really on the root causes. What is it? And at the end of the day, it really is an issue of discrimination, it's an issue of power, and it's an issue of inequality. So, um, I was going to ask um, Augustina if you, if you would be um, interested because you, you input it into the, into the best practice forum um, document, sort of different dimension of, um, of uh, looking at violence against women which could help us move um, some of our definitions forward. Would you like to share with us a little bit? No, it's okay. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Agustina Calegari again. I'm from Argentina, so be patient about my English, please. Um, I work at the Data Protection Authority at the Ombudsman Office in Buenos Aires. It's a human rights organization, organization, so I totally agree with that, that uh, human rights have to be applied to the internet. And um, we, that we are trying to do is to address the issue, not only for an empirical focus, but only for a general, from the general soci sociology, sociological theory. That's why I try to highlight this importance of the conceptual di con different dimensions of the violence against women in general, not only online. So I base my comment on a report made by Roberto Castro and Florinda Riquer from Brazil, they identified three dimensions of the violence against women. First of all, a conceptual dimension, where it's necessary to differentiate the physical violence from the emotional and from the economical area. Then we have the temporal dimension, in which every episodic violence uh, takes place, and a chronic violence, where it's a long-term violence, and we have to distinguish both of them. And I think with the internet cases, we are uh, focusing on a chronic violence because when you put an image online or, or a comment online against women, the, this is going to be online for a long term. It's not only for the moment. Um, as a data protector center and a privacy center, we are trying to focus on this issue because we don't believe it's a problem of the moment because of the way of the information flows on the internet. So we, uh, lastly, we have a, a evaluative dimension which makes the difference between violence measured by objective standards and the violence that subjectively perceived by women and men. It's, I think we saw that in the comments of the trolls and that is not the same what we perceive in, in each case. 
Um, so I think we should take into account this sociological theory when we spoke about when we speak about violence against women, and we are trying to do that uh, and at the data protection center. Oh, and I also want to highlight that the RAF produce stress that there are laws that address the violence of relating rights, that like privacy in this case, and that the, there are sometimes not advocate on gender specifically. So we are trying to address the issues, not only focuses on the data protection center, but only take into account the national law about violence against women. Thanks so much. Yeah, and that's also one of the things that we're finding is important to sort of start looking at it from what's the, what are existing remedies and existing laws and how do we kind of um, apply a new understanding to them. Yeah. And I think the, the, the differentiation in concept was actually quite interesting for us to unpack. So in the example of uh, online uh, Twitter harassment, for example, one tweet on its own may not look like much, but when you get 25,000 tweets, it's a lot, you know, it's, it's kind of overwhelming. So how do we also kind of conceptually address this issue in terms of our temporality and chronic? And so that's also really very useful. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so in terms of understanding and addressing the underlying causes, we thought it was important to also address um, the specific context and uh, intersections. Um, uh, and um, intersections. So in the, in the BPF document, we actually identified um, six. And we looked at girls and young women. We looked at women in rural, rural contexts. We looked at the role of religion, culture, and morality. Um, we looked at um, women of diverse sexualities and gender identities. Um, and women with disabilities, which was a gap and which was unfortunate because we really thought that this was a critical area that really needed more interrogation because it really um, it has an impact in terms of access to technology as well. Um, and then public women and women in, in technology fields. Um, you can check out the report to sort of look into these sections a little bit more. I won't go into that in detail. But what I would like to hear is um, from Mariana and, um, and uh, Nigat and Fran um, about the role of specific context. So let's start with maybe Mariana, um, the context in Brazil. Good morning, everyone. So to present myself again, I'm Mariana. I'm the director of Internet Lab. And at Internet Lab, we're developing a research about gender and the internet, focusing especially on revenge porn. Uh, so Jack, I'm really glad you asked me that because uh, the input that I gave to the BPF report were, was relating to um, a specific case. Uh, that's the top 10 case. And it's a case study that we're developing. Uh, we actually are, uh, we, we're publishing part of this study tomorrow at the, the GIS Watch uh, report, but we're still developing it. And it was a very special case for research because it was a case in which we could see how these markers were operating. In our case, especially age, class, and religion. So we were trying to look at revenge porn in Brazil and we started by looking at the cases in the media. And then uh, when we first heard of what was happening uh, in the peripheries of Sao Paulo, uh, we were um, kind of shocked by how it was uh, operating differently. Uh, the breaches of intimacy of girls in these areas were operating very differently. And it became very clear to us that it was very important if we were going to analyze how this sort of violence was happening in Brazil, that we took these variables into consideration. So uh, the top 10 case, just to be very uh, brief about it, um, is a practice that's been developing amongst teenagers. They're 12 to 15 years old especially in the peripheries of big cities in Brazil. We're studying two neighborhoods, uh, uh, peripheral neighborhoods in Sao Paulo, uh, where uh, human development indexes are very low, and uh, religion uh, is a very strong issue. Uh, so we're speaking about girls, uh, usually of religious families uh, in uh, poor areas uh, of Sao Paulo. And uh, what happens in the top 10 is that uh, lists are being developed by boys uh, it's a sort of slut shaming uh, of girls. Uh, they are ranked according to their sexual behavior. And uh, these boys develop, uh, they, they create videos in which they put the images of the girls with phrases uh, about, their, um, about their sexual behavior. And uh, if they're spreading these videos on WhatsApp, they sometimes use nudity. And if they just upload these videos to YouTube, for example, they've learned that it's very easy to take down uh, nudity from YouTube. So they're just using like girls' uh, Facebook profile pictures uh, with phrases uh, about their, their sexualities. And girls keep going from, uh, each week up and down in these rankings. 
and these rankings usually correspond to areas such as schools or small parts of neighborhoods. Uh, so we're following that case. It's very interesting, especially because uh, the case goes uh, inside and outside the internet all the time. It's led to all sorts of harassment uh, in schools, uh, graffiti uh, on, on neighborhood walls. And uh, what seems important for us um, uh, when considering class and religion and age is that uh, confronting the problem in this case is very different uh, from the other cases that we were following in the media. And sometimes the solutions that the community and the activists that we've been speaking to came up with were also very different from the solutions that uh, we had been seeing in the media or even in feminist groups. So, uh, for example, uh, we, had, we have a legal approach uh, to this research, so we were really um, wishing to see if there was something that the state could do uh, to confront revenge porn in Brazil. And the first time we went to speak to these activists, we were speaking like, oh, do you think anything could be changed in law? Or what do you do? Do you think there is, uh, there are resources in law to deal with that? And the, and the question was actually received with fear because we're speaking of neighborhoods in which state presence is very low in Brazil. Uh, and it's felt generally through the presence of the police, which is also felt as an organ that uh, exists maybe more to harass than to protect uh, these people from these neighborhoods. So like even speaking of criminalization or something was different uh, in these areas. Mm. Uh, so I think that uh, approaching um, uh, this case from this perspective is very important. Thank you very much. Yeah, we are also finding that uh, you know the response to this is actually quite complicated, and the often reg you know the usual response of legislative or policy approach might not necessarily be the best one. Nikat. Um, my name is Nikat. I'm from Pakistan. Uh, works for Digital Rights Foundation. Um, unfortunately, in Pakistan, there is no sex disaggregated internet internet users data. Um, but what we are witnessing that um, the way internet, user, u internet users are increasing, in the same way the violence against women is also increasing, but um, there, is no, um, there is no mechanism uh, about how to report these cases of violence or um, no legal mechanism, no, um, there is a government authority, but uh, like really use, uh, useless at this point in time. I just want to talk about the social context about uh, in terms of online uh, harassment um, and a recent case which uh, uh, which which is actually related to the Facebook uh, um, Peshawar, which is one of the very conservative part of Pakistan. Uh, women are using internet there, uh, but just to just to understand the social context, that most of the families do not know. That they're um, that the, that the, the that the girls are using social media platforms, or they are sharing their data, or whatever. Um, and when they face online harassment, they absolutely have no idea where to go and how to report the cases. They cannot go back to their families and ask for help or support. So recently, two hackers um, um, hacked uh, d different women's profile and. Um, disclose their pictures, and those are not intimate pictures. Those are just profile pictures wh where people can easily download from Facebook. And just their name, their college name, their addresses, their phone numbers. And releasing their data while making these pages on Facebook. And these women have been reporting the, these pages to the Facebook to take, down the, to take down the pages because those pages or the information are putting their lives on risk. And some of the families actually go, got to know about it because Peshawar is not a really big city. So people actually you know, know each other mostly. Um, and the result was that some families stopped their girls going to the colleges or universities, or um, some were actually beaten up by their fathers. That's why they shared their pictures on Facebook. Um, and whenever they, they, they reported the pages to the Facebook, Facebook always comes back saying that these pages do not violate our community guidelines. Um, then I got in touch with Facebook policy team and I tried to make them understand that they need to understand the social context. Maybe 
some forms of violence online is not really dangerous or risky in the Western society, but in some society, those are really putting women's lives at risk. So um, the role of platform, I think it's very important to understand the social context, to understand the local languages, and to uh, build their capacities up. They are, they are making money out of our data, right? So I mean, we are their product. So I think they need to understand that they, they are there for the users and respect their privacy and understand the social context. Yeah, thanks, Nigat. Um, it's reminding me of a similar case in Malaysia as well. And it's, it's really some school, you know, it's a case of, I don't know, it's like um, school yet bullying gone awry. Um, so this girl, she's in school, she, somebody created a Facebook page of her with her and her boyfriend just like that. Huh? And she's in the rural part of, of Malaysia, she's of a poor income family. And then the family found out about it um, because some, the teacher told them. So the teacher got involved, told the family, and the family pulled her out of school. So we're talking about right to education also being impacted um, from something as simple as that. So I think this, this really sort of unpacks a lot around, not just around underlying causes, but also the impact and what can you do about it. Um, Fran, what about um, your work around protection of women journalists? Um, good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, my name is Fran Amarovic. I'm the director of the Office of the OSC Representative on Freedom of the Media, uh, which is an intergovernmental organization covering 57 countries uh, of the Northern Hemisphere, so from US. Canada, Europe, uh, and the f all the states of the former Soviet Union. And we have been looking very much at this issue of the, from the context of safety of female journalists. Uh, throughout this year, we've been looking into how uh, female journalists have been affected through online uh, abuse. Because it's quite clear, it affects their safety. The moment it affects their safety, safety is one of the prerequisites of uh, freedom of the media and freedom of expression. Um, so the representative, um, has issued a number of recommendations to the governments because governments are essentially our main uh, counterparts in this area. We work directly with them. That um, they should really work and recognize that the threats of online abuse um, directly attack freedom of the media and freedom of expression because essentially women who have been abused, as we hear in other contexts, is they have been taken out of education, but the journalists that are, are being abused sometimes take themselves off uh, social media. They may ch choose not to report on certain issues, on certain topics, because of the abuse they have suffered. So that's leading to censorship and, in a way, self-censorship. It's also important that the law enforcement agencies understand uh, this issue, and they treat it se with seriousness, because what we heard in the past is when uh, women have come to report uh, such abuse uh, to the law, law enforcement they are not taken particularly seriously because it's not understood that a threat, uh, online threat, is just as real as a threat in a real world. And even in some contexts, what we have heard, it's actually even more uh, painful and more real because it's a threat that you quite often receive inside your house in a place that you should feel safe. You are also being harassed and threatened through your um, through your online activity. So it's something that the that the governments and the authorities need to do much more work and focus on law enforcement, but also prosecution and judiciary to understand the context and uh, to deal with it. Uh, what we do also see is that um, there is no, not, no real need to introduce new criminal legislation in this area. Uh, there is existing criminal laws uh, that can deal with this because any new legislation can uh, quite easily um, stifle freedom of expression and freedom of the media, and that could be quite problematic. So there is legislation that deals with threats, that deals with threats to violence, and quite often these threats are extremely of a graphic nature and explicit, so there's a fairly easy link to make to a threat to being a credible um, threat. Um, I'm glad to hear that there is some research and data uh, being collected about this because we really feel that it's it's relatively it's not a new issue but it's an issue that people are coming around to and I'm glad to hear it here at the IGF it's been now mentioned in a number of uh, forums uh, so it's something that everybody is becoming more aware of but we need more uh, data and understanding of uh, the effects um, of the abuse but also the sources of the abuse. Thanks, uh, Fred. Sorry. Oops. Yeah. Too close to my mouth. 
sorry. <laughs> Thanks very much. That's actually very, very useful. And thank you for also pointing out that um, the impact of threats online. Often we get we hear that it's it's not as real as offline threats. You know, it's just online. If you don't like it, just shut it off. So I think um, it's kind of important to also sort of break down this distinction. It's, it's actually not, not true. The, on, uh, the online is located within the offline. There's actually no real distinction, but what we need to unpack is the relationship rather than the distinction. Um, before I sort of open it back to kind of responses, maybe I would like to bring it to audience participation. Um, does anyone have any sort of uh, comments or questions or even cases that you would like to share? Um, too early? Okay. Good morning, I'm Bertrand Lachapelle, Director of the Internet and Transition Project. One question following up of a comment that was made earlier on the reaction of Facebook when there's a request to take down or to make an action on the pages that reveal the private data of people. Is it, is it really not um, something that would be forbidden according to the terms of service? Uh, I would think that, uh, I'm maybe not familiar enough, but I would think that disclosing private information on a page about a third person should be something that is taken into account. And if it's not, maybe it's an avenue to discuss with them. Ank, are you here? Do we have Facebook in the room? No? Um, okay, so one, I, I've, I've noted two responses, but let me just um, take the comment. No? Okay. Um, one more uh, Yo hablo más español. Voy a necesitar alguien que me ayude a traducir, si es posible. Uh, mi nombre es Miriam Rojas, uh, vengo de Bolivia, soy psicóloga y bueno, vengo trabajando un poco hace más de cinco años este tema de hacer prevención. I'm Miriam Rojas, I'm from Bolivia, I'm a psychologist, I've been working on this issue for more than five years. Um, yo veo de manera constante, he estado leyendo los informes durante este tiempo y siempre estamos hablando del problema, pero no de las soluciones. Y I, la I've been reading reports, I've been aware of the issue, and we're always talking about the problem, but not solutions. Eh, nosotros eh, somos una familia, eh, mi mami es abogada, eh, mi hermano es sociólogo y soy psicóloga y tengo un hermano que es informático. Esto me ha permitido a mí eh, ver y dar soluciones que, que hemos planteado en nuestro país y hemos logrado que nuestro gobierno nos apoye y hagamos campañas a nivel nacional y hemos capacitado a más de 20.000 estudiantes en Bolivia, precisamente haciendo prevención para que… Bueno, We're a family. In fact, my mother is a lawyer, my brother is a sociologist, I'm a psychologist, and my, my little brother is an information specialist. And that has allowed us to have a holistic approach in my country, which is Bolivia, to look at the solutions. And we've been working uh, with the government that supported us. We've been able to do national campaigns, and we've done uh, prevention exercises with kids, uh, over 20,000 in the country. Y bueno, eh, hemos trabajado con niños desde ocho años hasta 15, 17 y 18 años. Eh, el trabajo ha sido muy rico porque me ha permitido ayudar a reflexionar eh, y reestructurar contenidos para dar en estos talleres a estos chicos. Uh, we've worked with kids from age 8 to 15, also 17, 18 years old, and it's allowed me to really think this process through and also restructure what we do with the kids in the prevention program. Um, I'm very sorry, but... Poco. Entonces... <laughs> Creo que es importante que desde la uh, sociedad civil se trabaje en, te en temas de educación, prevención, eh, la responsabilidad social de las eh, proveedoras de servicios, del Estado, que creo que son dos entidades que están muy alejadas de lo que debemos hacer para prevenir eh, todo este problema que se da Internet. And so, I, I think that uh, uh, from a social civil society perspective, we do need to work in education and prevention, but also as part of social responsibility of the service providers, this should be an aspect, as well as the state. And those are two actors that are quite distant sometimes from that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're running a little bit short on time, so I'll ask you to hold your comments. We've sort of ran 
towards responses already. We are very, very sort of keen to move forward. But before we go there, we have a few bits more that we just want to go through, and then after that, we'll come back. Is that okay? Bueno? Boom. Okay. <laughs> um, so we also looked at... Um, uh, ah, okay. So we're here. So one of the things that often came up, and I think it's also come up in some of the inputs, is about the need to balance competing rights and interests, and the need to kind of consider all kinds, um, all rights and all interests. And the two issues that always came up in particular um, is, the, is the apparent tension between freedom of expression uh, and the need to address online violence against women. Um, and uh, thankfully, we have two fantastic uh, people who can help us think through some of this. And the other tension that also came up is around anonymity and privacy. Um, and that's also quite interesting because anonymity is critical um, for safety and also for expression, actually, and for all kinds of things. But at the same time, anonymity can also become uh, something that is being used for abuse. So how do we kind of um, um, balance between the two? So let's start with maybe freedom of expression with Rebecca. How do you think we should approach this um, tension? Thanks so much. Um, so I've been uh, spending a lot of time in the past couple of years looking at uh, the role of companies and, and platforms in particular, um, not only through the Ranking Digital Rights Project, but also through uh, a UNESCO-sponsored study on inter the role of intermediaries and in freedom of expression. I think Shen Hung is here somewhere, and there's going to be discussion of it tomorrow. Um, and, and uh, through kind of supporting the work of the Manila Principles Project, um, which is developing some principles for intermediary liability um, that are compatible with freedom of expression. And I guess one point I want to make is that um, in trying to resolve problems um, that, that occur on platforms, one of the reactions of policymakers is to hold the platforms legally responsible for the bad, ev evil, unacceptable behavior of many of, of the users of the platform. And what we've seen from studies of intermediary liability, you know, legal regimes around the world, that basically strong liability, you know, when, when the law is placing strong legal responsibility on platforms to police content, it always leads to over-censorship. Um, I'm not aware of any case where the, the censorship or, or kind of restrictions are done in a very sensitive way that only deal with real harassment and don't end up leading to the censorship of active activists and take down accounts of, of, of people who, who have a right to be speaking and, and who are engaging in, in legitimate speech and, and women who, who are trying to get their message out. So putting the responsibility on platforms often leads to platforms just whenever in doubt just taking things down because they, they don't have enough staff to kind of look at every single case with enough nuance. So, so that's, that's a problem with kind of heavy-handed approaches to the law, which, which also ends up not helping women. And, and we've seen some cases with platforms policing speech where actually, you know, from, from the perspective of violence, women, the, the kind of wrong people end up getting censored um, because the platform doesn't understand enough of what's going on. Um, and, and so that's always a danger um, when the platform feels it just has to do something, but it's, it's not, the, but they don't have the staff to really understand um, well enough. Um, so one of the things with the Ranking Digital Rights Project, um, and I'm, we have other sessions where we talk about the project itself, but um, we look at, we're basically measuring companies according to a set of standards for respect for freedom of expression, um, among other things, um, by companies. And we do not specifically have a question about, you know, does, what does the company do to control violence against women? However, the way we're structuring our approach, we assume that companies are going to want to have rules and, and it should be, you know, that it's, that it is not that it should just be a free for all, but, but companies do have a responsibility to set rules, enforce rules. But what's important is that there be transparency. So what we're looking at is, okay, is the company clear about what the rules are? Does it communicate that clearly to the users? Um, does the company engage with stakeholders? 
about how to formulate its terms of service in a way that actually is serving and respecting the user's rights? Is, is the company formulating a terms of service, you know, also through engagement of users? Um, in conducting human rights impact assessments, which we expect companies to do, is part of that assessment including an assessment of their terms of service enforcement and whether it's whether the the terms of service and its enforcement is actually serving its users well within a human rights context. So we're looking at that kind of proactive thing. We're also looking at to what extent companies are being transparent about what they're taking down, why they're taking it down on whose request, and whether there are grievance mechanisms. So whether there are adequate mechanisms for users to file a grievance if they feel their rights have been infringed in, you know, in connection with this company's business, and if there's some mechanism for redress. And so the grievance mechanisms being really important. And one final thing that we, we found through our research is that you know, of the 16 companies we looked at in the Ranking Digital Rights Project, only half of those companies report any information at all about their process for handling government requests, just government requests, you know, um, or third party requests for user information in general. Um, and then when it comes to data about what they remove, um, only six of the 16 companies we looked at release any information about the amount of content they're removing due to government requests. Only four of the companies released any data about content they're removing in response to private requests. So, you know, if there's an NGO that's sending them blacklists or, you know, private individuals making requests to take down content, only four of the 16 companies we looked at have any transparency at all about what they're doing. Mm. Um, none of the companies, zero, release any information about, about how the volume and nature of content they are taking down, restricting um, in enforcement of their terms of service. So part of the problem is, is that the process is really a black box yeah. and there's a lack of accountability and not enough stakeholder engagement and sort of assessment of what's going on. And I guess I would argue that perhaps that's a way forward that can help find the right balance as opposed to sort of heavy handed you know, we will throw everybody in jail kind of approach. Yeah, I don't think that's kind of a, a response that has been sort of quite, um, has been quite directed towards de dealing with this issue. Um, and transparency is also one of the things that we're finding to be quite important, an important way forward. But I think a lot of the, the, the freedom of expression um, work, and I'm not sure if the Ranking Digital Rights Project is also gender disaggregated. There is something about human rights that is also located within existing contexts and existing structural um, inequalities and discrimination. And how do we take that into account when we're doing sort of the process of balancing rights and interests? So, David, do you have a way forward for us? Coming from the shadows. Yes. <laughs> I think the number of people on this panel is a testament to uh, Jack says come, and you've just come to the panel. So um, actually, what everybody has said, I feel inadequate to, to the task here, because um, what, what everybody on the panel has said already, I think, covers quite a range of both the problem and some potential solutions. And I guess I would just, I wanted to identify three issues, three or four issues that are more along the lines of questions, although I'd start by saying, that it's just critically important that people share ideas of practice because there is good practice out there, um, but it's often buried. And so sessions like these are really important and projects like this are really important so that people have ideas about, what, about what's possible. So the first question, I mean, if we're talking about human rights and freedom of expression, maybe sort of toggling off of, uh, of Rebecca's comments is, First thing is definition. I mean, I think it's, it's really important for us to, to have definitions of the problem that don't over-regulate. Um, because very often the tools that we would want to use in order to counter harassment are going to be the same tools that are used to, to censor, as, as Rebecca was suggesting. So that's one thing I think is focusing on definition. A kind of sub-issue around definitions is um, whether any of the definitions vary according to the target of the harassment, in particular, whether we're talking about children or we're talking about adults. And I think there's 
there's some room there for distinctions about the kinds of um, restrictions that, that one might find acceptable depending on, on how that's operating. Um, the second is, I think, the big question uh, to a certain extent is who decides? And when we think about who decides, we're talking about a, a range of different kinds of actors, right? We're talking about you know, social change, uh, so the kind of campaigning that, that APC and others do, which is critical in order to uh, shed a light on harassment and to counter it in an effective kind of campaign-oriented way. There's the question of corporate approach. Um, there's legal and state sanctions, which are available, and I agree with Fran's point about there being quite, um, quite a, a great amount of existing law that is simply often not applied in this space because of the idea that this is only expression when in fact harassment is also um, is an act, not just an expression. And then, um, and then the last thing is just a question about user tools. So I agree, I mean, Jack, I think you, you made this point that you know, we don't want to put the burden on the target of harassment uh, to deal with it. Um, but at the same time, there are tools out there that we can use to, to shut it off in a to a certain extent, not to the full extent that's required. Um, but I think there does need to be some discussion about the tools that we have in order to block, um, the tools that technologists can offer in order to allow us some control um, in the face of harassment, which is really uh, a crisis in many, in many places, as has been shown by the panelists here. I'm, I'm going to have to run shortly, Jack, as I told you, but yeah. it's not personal. I'll, I'll try anyway. not to take it too personally. Um, but before you run, maybe that um, one tricky question, um, which is really around the thorny issue also around anonymity, and you've yeah. just come up with a report on that as well. Um, and um, I think we value, I mean, as feminist activists and, and advocates, Anonymity and privacy is critical and absolutely key and has, and as Paz was saying a couple of days ago, it's always been a political act of resistance that has been in the history of uh, feminist um, um, activism. However, is there a point in which um, your right to anonymity and privacy is forfeited because you have abused it, essentially? Yeah. And what is yeah. that point? <laughs> what is that point? That is maybe the, I don't know, used to say million dollar question that doesn't get you as far. I, you know, honestly, I don't, I don't know what the dividing line is, but it's clear that, I mean, with all tools, I mean, even, you know, pen and paper, I mean, all tools are subject to abuse, and that's clearly the case with, with respect to anonymity, and, um, and I think that, I mean, my, my main concern, and one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I did the report last spring on anonymity was because um, anonymity is under threat as a general matter um, by law enforcement and intelligence agencies. And I think that um, the absence of any tools of anonymity would be a very, very serious threat to activists and just to ordinary people who are searching for ideas and I, about their own sexuality, about their heritage, whatever it might be. So, um, so for me, I, I really wanted to um, flip the default, right? So that the default is anonymity. Um, I mean, I didn't say anonymity is a right, but anonymity is, a, is oftentimes a critical tool for people to enjoy their, their freedom of expression. If, if at least you start there, then you can identify what are the problems that arise and what are the abuses of anonymity. It's extremely hard to, um, to challenge anonymity, and then we, we end up in places where, like in the Delphi case, where you have you know, intermediary liability that can actually uh, you know, detract from freedom of expression too. So I, I honestly don't know what the line is. Maybe that should be the next report. But, but, it is, but at, at the first step, I think, is really to, to make the default that anonymity is allowed, and then we look at what are the, uh, what are the problems, and then than the solutions to the problem. Makes complete sense to me. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to maybe open it very briefly for one or two inputs, and then we will go back. So one there and one there. Marcin. Uh, thank you. My name is Marcin Kaminski. I'm CEDAS Policy Specialist on Freedom of Expression and ICT. I think this is a magnificent panel. Thank you so much for arranging it. 
I think it's important that the experts like like you on the floor uh, on the floor and in the panel are putting pressure on state actors as CEDA as well to take this seriously. Uh, of course, uh, Sweden is uh, known for its gender equ equality engagement, and, and I think that what we have been doing at CEDA, as a good example, as this is be best practice form, is to uh, use uh, a clear human rights-based approach and also a power analysis when dealing with freedom of expression issues. And when doing that, it states clearly that gender-based human rights violations in an on online context is something that needs to be dealt with from a freedom of expression perspective. And I think that this is something that should should be discussed even more uh, within our fields, of course, but together with ex experts as, as the ones on the floor. And I have actually, I have papers showing how CEDA works in these matters. I will happily share them and cards as well, of course, to discuss this further. Thank you so much for Thank this magnificent much. Thanks. Um, and Thank you. Um, I'm Judy Ward and I'm a member of the European Parliament. Um, I'm on the Culture and Education Committee and also the Women's Rights Committee. Um, and I'd be interested to, for people to say a bit more about women in, in public space because um, I, as soon as I was elected and I made my first speech in the Culture Committee, actually defending the Erasmus Plus program, which shouldn't be uh, particularly contentious. I was subjected to a stream of sexually abusive Twitter hate by an extreme right party, simply because I'd spoken um, about having a progressive Europe that wants young people to have mobility. But because I was a woman um, and dared to speak up, um, the abuse that I got was actually sexual abuse. That's actually one of the things that we are also finding is that yes, whilst people in public face abuse, but then there is something specific about the abuse that, um, that um, women in public positions face, which is actually often targeted towards this, your sexuality and your gender. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's of a different flavor and of a different volume, I think. Okay, um, so moving on. Uh, and and um, uh, so we've already started talking about some of the considerations. And I know if you have to go, it's, it's okay. okay. Okay, um, so we've already started thinking through some of the considerations for responses and this was also a big area in which um, um, the BPF was really trying to get as much responses as possible um, and we, we divided this according to sector actually. So the first, um, the first group that we looked at is um, really around public sector initiatives and what we found is that as, um, as uh, Rebecca was also saying, that there is a need to prioritise, uh, Rebecca and also Fran actually, there is a need to prioritise relief and redress over criminalisation. I think often the response of the state immediately is that, oh, we need a new law and it has to be a crime. Um, but actually, no, we, we need relief and redress like now. Can we focus attention and uh, investment in, into that area instead? Um, and the second thing that we looked at is there is a need to recognise the forms of harm beyond physical violence. Um, because there's often an attention, I think it's the link to crime as well, that the attention is often put just on physical violence, but there is a range... Uh, um, but there is a range of other kinds of impact, from psychological harm to um, impact on mobility, to economic, to education, and so on and so forth. Um, and then um, there was also a need to prioritize access to justice. I think this was also very key. Even if you had the laws, even if you had initiatives, and we looked at several different countries, as you saw earlier, um, the, the actual access to justice itself is not so simple. Um, and that this included the need for flexible and informal measures. So, for example, fast-tracked, specialised agencies, the, uh, the more improved use of protection orders and so on. So not necessarily the strong arm of the law as such. Um, and then we looked at private sector initiatives. Um, and, and this was a little bit more uh, complicated. As we can already see from the conversations, this really needed to be unpacked more. How can, you know, um, should internet intermediaries have more of a responsibility and what should this be? And how, how, how can this actually be um, implemented in a way that makes sense? So one of the things that, said it, that, uh, that the, the BPF found is that there is a need to explore intermediaries' commitments to human rights standards. And perhaps the RUGI framework um, is a useful way to do this. Um, the UN RUGI framework on, um, gosh, the three pillars, which I've completely escaped my brains now, but you can just quickly search it for now. Um, and the other thing that we looked at uh, was also there is a need to evaluate and study intermediary responsibilities. So really looking at existing um, um, initiatives, what are the different ways in which we can explore this. Um, work like a Ranking Digital Rights Project is very important and useful for this, but how do we also apply this in relation to understanding what is the intermediary's responsibility to also address this issue um, that is increasingly critical. 
And then uh, finally, the, the, finally, same with the state actually. Uh, there, even if there are measures and complaints mechanisms, there is really a need for greater ease for reporting. So not to make it like, you know, you have to jump through three million hoops before you can um, report something or not really understanding the process. Um, and also a transparency around it, not just in terms of how the complaints mechanism work, but how many reports do you actually get? Um, how many reports of harassment? It would be actually good to know, you know? Um, how, how many are responded to? In what way? Um, what are the different kinds of ways in which you can respond to this? And now training for staff. There's inadequate training for moderators and staff around how to address um, this emerging. Like, what do you do? And you can't just expect kind of uh, staff to suddenly automatically understand, oh, I can recognize that this specific issue, as Nigat was also saying, that this specific issue is, um, is, uh, has this impact in this particular context. So I think there's a, a greater need for that. Um, and then we also looked at um, community-led initiatives. So we really understood like many different actors to be doing different things. And uh, there was a whole host of them, but we generally collected them under um, community-led initiatives that looked at digital safety training and resources, and there was um, really several around this. Also around campaigns, awareness raising, and solidarity response. I think in relation, this is in particular around dealing with things like a, a, a massive amount of... Uh, when, when the attacks are, target, uh, uh, are, are, are swarming. So then this is where the, you know, knowing that you're not alone in responding to this is actually quite critical. And then there's also um, development of app, apps and technical solutions and trying to figure out what's the best way to do this. For example, harass map um, in Egypt. Um, and helplines. Um, so a lot of um, NGOs also set up helplines to try and provide information, to try and give uh, advice on what to do. And uh, finally, we sort of looked at multi-stakeholder intergovernmental roles in sort of facilitating multi-stakeholder responses. And either way, for all of the different responses, the measures have to be developed transparently and in consultation, not just with current and future users, but also with different stakeholder groups, including women's groups who have been working on gender-based violence for a long time. And I think that, that level of consultation is actually quite key in order to sort of try and understand the issue and bring it forward. So now, let's ask the difficult question. So we've been talking so much about internet intermediary. We have Hiba here from Google. Um, so yes, what's Google's response to this issue? What do you think are intermediaries' responsibility? And mm -hmm. does Google have a commitment to a human rights standard? Absolutely. Um, so thank you again for having me. I think one of the reasons that I'm really excited to be here today is because personally and as Google, we kind of recognize that the internet is only going to be this wonderful, robust place if everybody can participate online without fear of harassment, without fear of threatening. So, you know, trying to figure out how can we make these spaces for speech really dynamic and open and make the internet a, sp a, a place where um, communities who are marginalized offline can find sources of empowerment, can find community, and can really um, find kind of a good space for speech. So that said, we've kind of heard loud and clear from civil society groups and from other actors that you don't really want um, a, a, an intermediary to make blanket decisions about what qualifies as harassment. As a lot of my panelists have mentioned, a lot of this stuff is incredibly subtle. It depends on context. You can't really have a one-size-fits-all solution for all of it. That would be incredibly damaging to, to free speech. So what we do instead is we rely on users um, to really flag content for us. And as um, David mentioned while he was here, making the tools for reporting as easy to use, um, as intuitive as possible for users around the world. That said, I think some of the things that we're dealing with is um, you know, building scalable systems, understanding context and subtlety, um, and also trying to recognize good policies that aren't overbroad and that don't um, have the, the negative implications on speech that Rebecca highlighted before. So just um, to quickly give a kind of an overview on how we're handling these issues, um, you know, we don't allow content um, that promotes or condones violence that has the primary purpose of inciting hatred based on sexual orientation, gender identity, gender, race, ethnic origin, age, nationality, and veteran status. And what we're doing, though, is we're really focusing on the fact that a lot of these issues, as my panelists have mentioned, aren't just online issues. They're issues with offline roots. So you can't just you know, play whack-a-mole with the content online and hope that the problem will go away. So we've been building a lot of partnerships with um, some of the groups actually highlighted in the BPF draft, some of the groups that have been in this space for a really long time. Um, we have partnerships with helplines. We have partnerships with 
organizations like the National Network to End Domestic Violence to make sure that technology can facilitate safe spaces and can empower marginalized communities. Um, a couple of the other areas that we've been focusing on is um, digital literacy and safety that's come up in the BPF draft and uh, several of my panelists have raised that as well, making sure that people understand how to use technology in a way um, that's responsible and have to have full control over their online presence. We've also been focusing a lot on um, you know, counter speech and helping people really take advantage of online platforms to get their message out and to, to kind of really um, push back a little bit. And that's been really, really, really helpful. So those are kind of our high level overviews. I'm happy to dig deeper into product specific um, policies and things like that, but um, that's, that's how we're approaching these. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other kind of uh, private sector um, representation in the room? Maybe from Twitter or Facebook who might want to also speak or any other kind of, uh, I mean these are like the familiar people, not the three, uh, but there could be other innovative private sector responses. Essentially, um, hold that thought if you do uh, and then we will come back to you. Okay, um, next maybe we can go to Gary. I mean ITU has recently sort of really looked at this issue and prioritized it. So why, why now? Why do you see it as critical and what do you see is the link between this issue and also access? Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be able to be part of this. Um, well, I, first, in terms of the private sector, I want to uh, maybe that's a place to start. And uh, first of all, with Google, I, I believe that you recently announced that you're going to eliminate uh, revenge porn from your search results, which I think is a very bold step. And I hope it inspires and encourages others in the ICT industry to, to you know, really fully engage in the problem. And that's that's part of it. And, uh, in terms of private sector and public sector, we do have an entity called the UN uh, Broadband Commission for Digital Development, now called, renamed for Sustainable Development. And as part of that, uh, uh, we have a working group on gender, which recently released a report that I'm supposed to tell you a bit about. Uh, and the report is uh, uh, talks about uh, combating online violence against women and girls, a worldwide wake-up call. And you know, I think the results of which we've heard a lot of here it reaffirms what has been obvious. And what wasn't obvious to some of us was the kind of revengeful uh, response that <laughs> this, this discussion uh, generates. But the highlights are pretty straightforward. What we found was that 20%, 26% of law enforcement agencies in 86 countries surveyed uh, only 26% of the law, agent, law enforcement agencies in 86 countries are taking appropriate action. Uh, that women in the age uh, range of 18 to 24 are uniquely likely to experience stalking and sexual harassment in addition to physical threats online. One in five female internet users live in countries where uh, that online harassment uh, is unlikely to be punished. Uh, none of this, I think, is probably surprising to anyone here. Uh, and we, we have discovered, we also discovered that, you know, obviously women are reluctant to report this, uh, their victimization uh, to, as a result of uh, fear of social repercussions. And, and uh, again, that's, that's, I don't think, particularly new. Uh, but I think what we do have that's a bit new is that we need to look at uh, some basic uh, recommendations, things like uh, we're calling it the three S's, sensitization, safeguards, and sanctions. Sensitiz sensitization, preventing cyber violence through training, learning, campaigning, et cetera, stuff that we're doing right here, right now. Sca safeguards implementing oversight and maintaining a responsible internet infrastructure through technical solutions uh, and more informed uh, customer care practices. And I'm going to get to the role of uh, education, I think, in a, in a moment. And sanctions, and probably this is the most controversial part, developing and upholding laws, regulations, and government mechanisms, which are there and have, are in place, and, uh, but uh, maybe are not being upheld to the manner that they, they would be. So. I think that will, that brings me back to really what I want to talk about is that uh, we've heard this is a human rights issue. Yes, it is, clearly. It's not just a, a, uh, a women's issue. It's an issue of privacy. Uh, it's an issue of gender equality. And it's an issue of Article 19 of the rights and of, uh, UN Rights uh, Declaration that states that we have the, the right to hold and express opinions across all media and all frontiers. A very uh, far-reaching thinking uh, guarantee of free speech that was developed in 1946, but is only really recently, I think, being really tested thanks to the internet. Uh, so it, it's a nexus of those three um, human rights issues, and it's a very difficult nexus to balance. But I'm going to, I think, get personal here. I think anybody in the audience today who, like me, shares an X and a Y chromosome 
uh, would agree that the vast majority of our brothers are shocked and appalled by the kind of online behavior of trolls and online stalkers. Really, I, I do. I mean, I'm an old guy. I have three sons. What do I know? This is all the fact that I'm here talking about gender issues it always surprises me. My father was one of six boys. I have no brothers. I have three sons. But I do know that, you know, frankly, that violence against women and, uh, and girls, whether it's online or offline, is only going to stop uh, when men and boys decide to stop it. I mean, I think it's as simple as that, frankly. And yes, there are men and boys who are being harassed online, but the research indicates that 90% of the intended victims of some types of uh, online violence and sexual harassment, especially revenge porn, are women. That's simply a fact. And ensuring the safety and security of, of these women and girls online is something that we all have to be concerned about because it's not just a human right, rights issue to me. It's a, it's a matter of human dignity. You know, why are we treating uh, women, uh, our sisters, our mothers, our daughters, our friends like this? I, 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 just, I just don't get it, frankly. It's a matter of, of dignity, and I think it's up to men and boys and the education of boys and men that this is not acceptable. This is, this is not a matter of restricting your rights to freedom of expression. This is a, a matter of treating, learning to treat people with respect, your fellow, fellow human beings with respect. Thanks, and, Gary. And that's a very, very hard thing to do. So in that line, I, I'll quit. Uh, thank you for this time. But I, I really would like to see the men and the boys in this audience and those that are on the, online, uh, you know, really rising to this issue. This is not just a women's issue. This is an issue for all of us. Uh, but we're, you know, it's only going to stop when the X and the Y chromosomes <laughs> out there decide to stop it. I guess everyone needs to sort of take action around this. Thanks very much. Um, so Patrick, um, the Istanbul Convention, it has been really looked at as one of a, you know, quite a strong approach to addressing the issue of um, violence against women broadly. How does it integrate sort of the online dimension as well? It certainly does. But um, there's been said so much already that um, I, I really feel humbled by the interventions both of the public and of the, of the panel here. Um, I think the basic starting point remains it is indeed a human rights issue. And if it's a human rights issue, it needs to be balanced with regards to other human rights. And what David, David Kay said at the beginning, we need to clearly define what we're talking about. We need to see who is acting and we need to see what, what we can be doing. And uh, that is what the, basically the, Buddha, uh, the, 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 the uh, Istanbul Convention, which is the convention uh, combating violence against women, tries to set out. It's not just about criminalization acts. It is also about what can we do and who can do what. I think we are, we are past the stage of lynching and revenge as the ultimate legal tools that we possess to deal with issues. I think it's very important that we rely on clear legislation, on clear regulations in order to see where we are going whether these regulations and legislations are worked out by governments or parliaments or whether they are self-structured uh, through internet intermediaries, through service providers, I think that does not really matter all that much. What we have to be careful about is that we do not legiferate in many different directions. Um, one of the rights in freedom of expression is also the right to offend. And the right to offend, who is going to say what is the offense and what is not? And who is then going to start deciding? I think it's very, we're, it's, uh, of course, we're all like-minded in this room, I thoroughly think. But we have to be also extremely careful that we do not um, ensure that we, we have a multitude of judges and a multitude of courts that are going to each in their corner decide on what is good and bad for us. Because then we are going the wrong way. Then we are opening ourselves to a legislation that goes in different direction based on morals, based on history, based on religion, based on many different aspects. So it's extremely important that we, we see a little bit the hierarchy of things, that we first of all define very clearly 
what we want to be doing. Secondly, who has the responsibility to do what, uh, whether that is courts, judges, uh, whether that is internet intermediaries with um, uh, own regulations, self-regulation. And then thirdly, that is, and there's plenty of examples of that in this room, that is to see what action, positive action to undertake. And legislation, and that's also the case of with the Istanbul Convention, positive action can also be part of the legislation, whether that is stimulating service providers to think about their own role, um, stimulate ethical thinking, stimulate internal controls, stimulate training, skills training, awareness raising, those are the items we need to be looking into. And it's a complexity of things, and that's also what the Istanbul Convention tries to provide. Thank you. Thanks very much, Patrick. Um, it is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really good to think about it in sort of clear ways in terms of how we need to address different things at different levels. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, Narelle, <laughs> one of the gaps from the BPF that we really noted as well, apart from looking at our, uh, the context of women with disabilities, um, is what can the technical community do? So, so far we've looked at state, we've looked at community, we've looked at private sector, but what about the technical community? Well, normally when I, I speak in Australia, actually, the first thing I do is to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land, of the land and the, their elders past and present, so I'll try and do that first here as well in Brazil, even though I don't know any yet. Um, but some of the, the things, that the projects that I've been involved with in Australia, um, we've had a project running for a while called on technology facilitated stalking and violence and abuse where we've been working with the uh, Domestic Violence Resource Centre Victoria and the New South Wales Women's Legal Centre and developed a, 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 a guide to all of the different laws that are in place in Australia right across the different sectors that are involved with online stalking and abuse. And as part of that analysis, they found over 70 pieces of legislation, because we've got, got seven main legal jurisdictions, being a country that has states inside it, um, so that, and very few of them seem to have any harmony between them. So there, there were a whole raft of different pieces of legislation that could be used to get these guys. Um, but in the most part, what the domestic violence workers have been finding is that when they get down to the police station with a whole swag of evidence, no one wants to do anything. The police don't want to act. They don't want to take it seriously. Look, love, just get off Facebook. You know, just don't go there. And that's not an appropriate response because that's where a lot of that woman's support is. She shouldn't have to get off social media. He should have to stop, <laughs> or whoever else happens to be doing it. So if you'll excuse that little um, rant on my part. So one of the things we wanted to do was not only to put together a, a guide it's called smartsafe.org.au on all the different applicable pieces of legislation across Australia and put that in the hands of the domestic violence workers so that they knew what types of evidence they needed to collect and what also what technical steps they could take to assist the women from un, sort of shackling themselves from the the, um, uh, the the various pieces of stalk aware and other mechanisms that were in place. Th simple things like changing all of the privacy settings on someone's phone, all of these basic housekeeping things that perhaps a lot of women hadn't been doing. Um, because they were happily using the phone that their ex-partner had bought for them and that their ex-partner was still paying for and that under the Australian data retention laws, their ex-partner as a subscriber will now have access to all of the data that is being retained on that particular woman. So there's a few little things that we're trying to unpick and unravel across all of that. Um, so if I move perhaps back to what I probably should be talking about, that's what the Internet Society is trying to do as a whole. So under the, the realm of the, uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is the, the happy land where all of the technology standards are developed for how the Internet works. <laughs> now, we'll, 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 we'll speak respectfully now here, sir. <laughs> we have our layers. <laughs> So there is, um, unfortunately, I have been involved, or I've had to be involved with writing a, an RFC, a request for comments, in the IETF on um, uh, bringing about more diversity and not bullying in the Internet Engineering Task Force. And that RFC is gradually making it, well, that the draft is gradually making it through to RFC status. Unfortunately, we, we within the technical community need to have to tell each other how to be nice. 
um, and that's you know people get people get carried away with ideas and they will champion them passionately which is great and we should but we should also not degenerate to ad hominem attacks. We yeah. should be taking apart the ideas and, and wrestling with that. So we've, we've now, like a lot of other professional organisations, started to adopt standards for behaviour within our own technical development communities. And that has kind of run in parallel with the, the other safe spaces that a lot of the women developers have developed throughout the whole the whole um, community of, of developers. So you have forums like, like Sisters, Sisters at IETF and Sisters more broadly. And these places are where women can come together and build support for each other and, and be stronger in their development and their, their sense of um, their own technical careers. So security and security online is fundamental to the Internet Society's mission. Recently, the, the IETF, or the Internet Architecture Board, released a statement on encryption and it being available at all layers of the internet. So these are the sorts of things that, that we've been, we have fundamentally done throughout all of the creation of internet standards, is to try and address security at all fundamental levels, and, uh, and now more recently to put in privacy con conditions all the way up the technology stack. But that doesn't get to stopping violence against women. You know, these are just some of the tools that we have to help women and, and our male colleagues to use constructively um, rather than to, to abuse. And actually that's a really critical layer that often we look at all, all different layers, but somehow the kind of, um, um, how do we think of prioritising privacy standards within the development of technology is also another critical layer to address um, in looking in this issue that often doesn't, maybe doesn't quite get as much attention um, as it should. Okay, um, before going back here, let's go back here for about for, for, for five minutes. And I would actually like to ask you a specific question, um, which is, where do we go from here? The best practice forum process has been really, really um, very, very difficult, but very good in terms of trying to gather all of the different stakeholder thoughts and work and responses in this area. So where do we take this work? Um, clearly, we are, we are sort of moving towards uh, different kinds of solutions and, re and responses. What do you think we should, um, where, where, where should we go from here? And I see three, three hands up. One here, one here, and one. Oh. Sorry, I have to give the people who haven't spoken. Hi, uh, my name is Jan and I'm from the APC. I'm not going to respond to Jack's question. I'm sorry, because I had a set of questions already. Um, I just want to make three points. Firstly, while it's really great to hear that Google is reaching out to women's organizations, they mostly are in the United States. And our work is really showing us that the responsiveness of private sector actors and companies really mm -hmm. is not the same in terms of women's experiences of the global south. Mm -hmm. And the point that Nigat was making, I think, is really important. Um, the second point is around the recommendations of really looking at counter speech. I think that conversation also needs to happen in a way that doesn't make an assumption that it's an equal playing field. Because that already has to recognize women's existing inequalities and the existing exclusions, both in technology and in our ability to participate. So I think the counter speech response really needs to be unpacked a lot more. And lastly, I think there's a lot of emphasis on freedom of expression in a way that really is locating it also outside of the broader realities of existing inequalities. And also, it's not only about speech when we're talking about violence against women. It's also about online harassment. It's also not only about the unknown, so it's also about the fact that our research shows that one out of three women, the experiences are related to someone that they know. So I think the conversation also needs to be much broader. Yes, speech matters, but I think it's one of the areas that we actually have moved quite further along into, and we need to look at other issues as well. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully the next person might answer my question. Um, but because we're running quite short on time, so I'll, I'll ask you to please keep your interventions quite short. Yeah, please. I'll be quite straight. Uh, my name is Sridhi Prahimaji. I'm one of the Internet Society ambassador, and I'm an activist and a blogger. I have a blog about uh, the women issue, about uh, violence against women. And I believe as dynamic as the topic it is, the solution should be dynamic. We cannot refine it because uh, something, uh, it, it's, it's not regional, it's, it happens uh, differently. So a multi-stakeholder and a discussion like this should be rolling on and uh, the evolution process should go on so that better solution, better answers, because right now we, we, we might have a definition here, but 
four, four years uh, forward, we would not have the same definition because things are changing, technology is changing. Yes. It's, it, it's, it's going to impact us. And uh, like he said, you know, we have to step up. The men, the group, we have to step up. Until and unless we recognize it, until and unless we say it's wrong, it's not going to change. Because in Nepal, a similar case happened like this. Just the case, I'll just uh, highlight the case. I'm going to have to cut you. Okay. I'm sorry, but okay. thank you very much for that. I yeah, really appreciate we it. We have to step up. The men group, we have to step okay, up. Okay, thank you. I love the men in this room. It's great. <laughs> okay. um, Thanks. I'm Courtney Raj from the Committee to Protect Journalists, and you asked what we should do next. It seems like, okay, definitions, that's one thing, but it seems like a lot of the issues raised in the online violence against women debate and figuring out solutions are similar to those that are being raised in the um, conversation around hate speech online and in the conversation around countering violent extremism online. And I think that a good next step would be to get into conversation with you know, what's happening on those issues. For example, the OSCE just held an expert workshop consultation in Romania on countering violent extremism, and I wish we had heard such a strong um, support for not privatizing censorship with intermediary, you know, intermediaries, and, you know, what the experts said at that workshop is that removing content online is, is pretty ineffective, and yet we didn't see that reflected in the actual recommendations that came out from the OSCE. So I actually think that this conversation, th the conversation about solutions and how different actors should play are similar across those different debates. And I specifically would like to know from Google in terms of um, you know, the, the algorithmic choices that you make um, and whether you know, I, I haven't, we haven't heard anything about the technical or al algorithmic mm -hmm. aspect of this. Thanks, Courtney. Um, very quick, um, really one sentence, and I will probably cut you off, and I'm very sorry, but I can be quite rude. I'm going to answer your question. Um, and this is the IGF, and we've heard about IXPs and about certs and about capacity building and how there's a need for collaboration um, to do those things adequately. Maybe we need collaborations in the hotlines, in the groups, in all of these different organizations that are dealing with this issue of harassment of women and girls online. Maybe we need to collaborate, we need to get together, we need to have a forum. Susan Benish, Dangerous Speech Project. Rebecca mentioned uh, research. Studies have shown. Um, this is a room full of, of I, uh, tech-oriented people, we are, if we're looking for solutions, they should be based on data, on evidence, on research. So I'd like to uh, answer Jack's question by suggesting that um, we look for opportunities to do specific targeted research on what will work, and if possible, do it collaboratively across contexts and across countries, because as many people have said, the contexts are different. So there will be different solutions in different cases. There are also some circumstances in which certain responses or certain uh, solutions will work across contexts and across platforms. That's it. Thank you. Um, one at the back. And is there any more? If not, that will be the final comment. And then I'll give last words, like I literally mean words. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, Valentina, bosnia Herzegovina. I would say there is no one solution but data. We need data and we need community. And we also need to connect the dots because we talk about the women's body, but this means a lot about sexuality. This connect with religion, with blasphemy. Sexuality is the reason why women's body is attacked. And we need to connect those two things and to never forget that there are different non-normative bodies. And the, the attack is directed to any of them. Thank you very much. So what I'm hearing is that there is a need for greater kind of focus on solutions, greater looking at um, what, could, uh, what could, but actually more around um, facilitating conversations between different actors, different initiatives, and in order to be able to do more targeted research as well as try and unpack some possible solutions towards this um, issue. So that's also some of the findings that we, have, that, we, that we looked at in terms of the BPF, in terms of what's needed. There's a need for greater research and statistics into understanding the extent and the prevalence of this issue. Um, greater awareness around this and also online literacy is an important component um, in, 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 in terms of um, looking into this. Um, okay, so final sort of like a little quickie. No, I think I can second more or less everything that you said. And 
it should really be uh, focused on education, on internet literacy as well, that people understand what they're doing online uh, had a real effect on an offline world of other people. It's not just a comment that they've thrown into the world, into the ether, but it's, it affects people's lives. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to stress that we need data about this issue, that we need context, especially that we need interse intersectionality when we, we're discussing solutions uh, for gender issues. Thank you so much. Um, I just definitely want to kind of reiterate some of the calls for data, some of the calls for more research. Um, Courtney, I would love to connect with you after this to talk more about that, um, about the technical aspects. And I just want to say thank you for all of your input. We definitely have been furiously taking notes and um, boosting transparency, um, boosting um, our commitment to human rights, which we are already committed via the Global Network Initiative and several other organizations. But um, uh, that is something critical for us. So we'll keep improving. Thank you. Um, I think we don't need new legislations uh, because demand of new net legal mechanism is often a result in a controlling internet and ICTs. So need to um, need to uh, you know use existing legislation and more training of law enforcement agencies and judiciary. Just a quick comment about the draft. It's still open until tomorrow. And I also neglected to say thank you to a lot of faces in this room who contributed case studies and attended virtual meetings. Without you, this wouldn't have happened. Thanks. Yeah, it's brilliant work. I must have a go myself. Um, we, I think we definitely need to get a balance in between the technology solutions, the education of both the women who use it and the domestic violence workers and other law enforcement workers who work with women um, to try and help them build their privacy and build their strength online, to build their abilities online. Uh, I, will, uh, I would like to highlight the importance of the truth to the national issues because we need uh, to strengthen the multi-stakeholder uh, cooperation, at least in Argentina, because this is our problem now. Yeah, just to uh, plus one on the data and, and research and, and fact-based, you know, solutions based on understanding of actual facts rather than sort of broad assumptions. Um, but also, just a, just sort of a, a plea for, I think we need to find more ways to bring the right communities into conversation with the right people in the companies. And, and companies often are not quite sure who to reach out to. And there's starting to be some mechanisms and sort of intermediary organizations that help connect people in, in companies with the right sort of NGOs and communities on the ground in particular places where the context um, can be provided um, and where the real conversation for problem solving can, can be had. And I think your organization and your, your initiative provides one potential conduit for, for that conversation. And there, are, there are a number of others as well, but kind of building those bridges so that there can be an effective sort of problem solving approach um, when, when companies are sort of faced with so many different issues at once and they don't quite know who to ask um, to okay. figure out how to pro solve problems. Okay. Yeah, our Council of Europe convention is called uh, the Istanbul Convention Combating Violence Against Women. It is naive to think that things will go away without effort. It is naive to think that we'll, we're li in a linear process towards eliminating violence against women. I think it's a daily uh, struggle. Uh, I think when I was a student 30 years ago, we were speaking more or less about the same thing. So it's a daily effort and a daily struggle from all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much to the contributors to the Best Practice Forum. As Anri is saying, really, without your contribution and input, it would, not be, um, it would not be possible. And I do encourage you to have a look at it. I know it's scary. I know it's 162 pages. But it's not all. It's also including appendices. And it's really a good resource. Um, and thank you very, very much for being here and for your participation as well and to the panelists. Thanks. <laughs>